Our journey is going to begin by addressing anthropology as a field um, and really asking what is anthropology and then uh, addressing the four subfields that anthropology covers. So to define anthropology, it is the study of the human species and its immediate ancestors. Now we have to ask, who are our immediate ancestors? Well, we will offer a broad view about humanity. Um, we will look at all aspects of culture. We will compare, we are a comparative science that examines all societies, ancient and modern, simple and complex. So this gives a little bit of insight into kind of the who might fall under the umbrella of anthropology. We can look at contemporary populations, we can look at historical populations, um, and in some regards we can look at prehistorical populations. But we're not only concerned with Homo sapiens sapiens, we are also concerned with those species that gave rise to our fully modern species. So um, we will talk about <coughs> ancestral hominins, for example. You've probably heard of maybe Lucy, who's Australopithecus afarensis. Um, we will talk about also non-human primates as our immediate ancestors. And that's one thing, you know, myself with a background in biology, um, I knew I wanted to study primates, but wasn't at a university that had an anthropology program. And so as I pursued graduate programs, I found that really the only departments in which you can study non-human primates are psychology for cognitive type research and anthropology. And so non-human primates fall under this umbrella of our closest living relatives. Anthropology is unique in that it offers this cross-cultural perspective. There are a lot of ways in which anthropology and sociology kind of, let's say, blur the line between them, um, study some of the same issues, sometimes study some of the same populations. Um, but sociology has historically been focused on industrialized or post-industrial Western nations, where anthropology has focused on oftentimes small-scale non-literate populations. Anthropology is a comparative and holistic science. Holism is defined as the study of the whole of the human condition, including its past, its present, its future. We make conjectures about where humanity will go from here. Uh, studying human biology, human society, human language, and human culture. And critically, anthropology is poised to offer us uh, a way to examine, a lens in which to examine the diversity that arises through human adaptability. And this is one key critical aspect is that we are incredibly adaptable and we can do so both biologically and culturally. And so anthropology can really address some of these issues and some of these mechanisms. We are among the most adaptable animals. I mean, when we look at the variety of niches that we're able to, to uh, exploit, when we look at the ecosystems in which humans live, we're found almost, almost in every single one. Really, arguably the only places that we can't live full time without support are Antarctica. We've got to bring in supplies because there's not anything that we can grow in Antarctica. And then, uh, deep ocean. We, uh, we have a problem with pressure as we get down too deep. We don't have any fully uh, submerged human cities, for example. We could also argue that maybe the interior of volcanoes, but there's not a whole lot of life that can persist in the interior of volcanoes. They've recently found some uh, sulfur-based bacteria and microbes that are able to live inside volcanoes, but those are few and far between. We, like other animals, use biological means to adapt to a given environment, particularly when we think about um, kind of our our evolutionary history. You know, we talk about losing our hair, for example, or losing our fur. Uh, we talk about changes in our teeth. These are certainly biological ways that we're adapting. Uh, many of you um, have or will have to have your wisdom teeth removed, for example. We'll talk about wisdom teeth in the context of uh, ancestral hominins and wisdom teeth were necessary because by the time we reached about 18 or 19 we'd worn down our other molars and so um, we now though we've relaxed that selection pressure on wisdom teeth because we cook our food because we eat processed foods and so we've now got a full third of the population that doesn't even grow wisdom teeth. We are unique <coughs> however in 
and utilizing cultural means of adaptation. We are not the only cultural species. When we talk about the origins of human culture, we'll talk a little bit about what non-human primates express uh, with tool use, with uh, large-scale cooperation, with greeting displays, etc. We can also talk about toothed whales uh, like dolphins and orcas in this context of, um, of cultural adaptation. Dolphins and orcas <coughs> are arguably some of the most uh, the smartest mammals out there even when compared to our own species um, and use a wide variety of cultural traits including tool use like bubble nets uh, they've got regional dialects to their languages uh, etc our ability to adapt culturally is one of the things that has allowed us to exploit almost every single ecological niche on the planet. I mean, we go to cold climates, we don't have to wait to grow thicker fur. We're able to use the skins of other animals, or in a modern context, we're able to use Gore-Tex and, and artificial insulators. <clears throat> we're able to use electricity to power heaters, etc. Adaptation is defined as the process by which organisms cope and potentially change with environmental forces and stresses. We're unique in using both our biological and cultural means of adaptation, and some of our adaptations may involve an interaction between culture and biology. So what do you see here? Well, you see on the left some uh, presumably Western uh, quote-unquote explorers or mountain climbers uh, who've paid an exorbitant amount of money to summit Everest um, and use a wide variety of cultural means for that. They've, uh, they've, for example, are wearing Gore-Tex fabrics, they're wearing you know, coverings, uh, clothing that's made from synthetic fabrics and, and really kind of technology based. They're also critically using supplemental oxygen. On the right hand side, you've got the remnants of using technology, using culture to summit Everest. You've got all of these discarded oxygen tanks. By and large, most of the litter that's on Everest consists of um, oxygen tanks that have been discarded. Um, notice the individual who's cleaning them up. It's not one of these white Westerners who uh, presumably paid about $30,000. No, instead uh, it is one of the Nepalese Sherpas. And so these two pictures really offer this juxtaposition. How do we adapt to uh, this kind of harsh environment, high elevation, low oxygen concentration, very cold? <coughs> so we'll start <coughs> with the picture on the right in the Nepalese Sherpa. <clears throat> Nepalese Sherpas uh, have lived at high elevation for generations. We're talking about, at the very least, thousands, if not tens of thousands year, of years. And so this uh, history, this uh, kind of ethnic history of living at these high elevations has given them a unique suite of biological or genetic adaptations. This includes a different body build. Sherpas are short and stocky, whereas if we were to look at the Maasai uh, in the savannah of Kenya, they would be very tall and lean and lanky. Think about some of the Kenyan marathon runners. Um, Sherpas are, are stocky and have a barrel chest. Um, being stocky and, and kind of uh, shorter uh, it, it decreases the surface area through which body heat can be lost. Um, having this large barrel chest means that with each breath, uh, lungs are able to expand even wider, so more oxygen is able to be brought in. The Sherpas also face a developmental adaptation, which is biological in nature. If you grow up in uh, environments that are high elevation, low oxygen concentration, your lungs become more highly vascularized. What that means is you've got uh, denser blood uh, vessels in your lungs. You've got more arteries and veins uh, going to and from your lungs. You've also got uh, a denser web of capillaries in your lungs. This is coupled with more air sacs forming in your lungs during development. <clears throat> so as your lungs grow, you're basically increasing this kind of interface between air sacs and capillaries, which means your, your uh, cardiovascular system, your blood vessels are better able to extract oxygen from the air that you breathe in. So you've got more efficient uh, kind of respiration. Um, additionally, there's a short-term physiological adaptation that we all possess. I don't know if all of you are from Albuquerque, but even if you've grown up in Albuquerque, if you are to climb to the top of the Sandias and then try to run up the stairs to the Overlook, 
you're going to find yourself out of breath. Places like Albuquerque, Boulder, Denver are places where people who are endurance athletes often come to train. They do this because when you train at high elevation, you change the density of your red blood cells per unit volume blood. And so by training for an extended period of time, it takes about two to three weeks of lower kind of athletic competency or, or athletic output. Um, but after that point, your, uh, your blood, red blood cell density starts to adapt to a lower oxygen environment. And so effectively, you are um, naturally blood doping. You are increasing the number of red blood cells that you find per unit volume blood, which means you've got more available sites for oxygen to bind to the hemoglobin in those red blood cells. So you're able to harness more oxygen from any environment, but particularly this oxygen poor environment. When athletes then go and run their races at sea level, that gives them a competitive advantage. And then lastly, our cultural or technological adaptations to <clears throat> high elevation, low oxygen concentration. We've talked about those. We've got artificial kinds of uh, synthetic fabrics that keep us warm. We've got supplemental oxygen. Even if you're flying in an airplane, we've got pressurized cabins that allow you to breathe normally. And in the event of a loss of cabin pressure, we've got oxygen masks that drop from overhead. Social and cultural adaptation has become increasingly important for human groups over time. The rate of cultural adaptation has rapidly accelerated over the last 10,000 years. Well, what happened 10,000 years ago? Uh, it was the advent of food production. The cultivation of plants and the domestication of animals developed uh, firstly around 12,000 to 10,000 years ago. And so what this did was dramatically change the human diet also dramatically increased human population density. And we'll talk about the whys of that a little later in the semester, but cumulatively what that does is frees up some people from the process of production. In agricultural economies, you don't need everyone to work in the fields. And um, particularly as you develop agricultural technology like plows and such, you're able to concentrate the effort perhaps of farmers slash peasants uh, on producing food and you're able to free up people um, in middle class to upper class uh, to pursue a variety of endeavors, to pursue art, to pursue mathematics and science, music, um, architecture, etc. We see the first civilizations develop around six to 5,000 years and with this we see disposable wealth, we see uh, exaggerated advertisements of disposable wealth, like monumental architecture, like the pyramids, etc. We also see a rich development of occupations, what we call occupational specialization. We see the rise of the merchant class, we see um, artistic endeavors, etc. Then in the late 1700s, early 1800s, we innovate industrial production. We go through the Industrial Revolution. And so this rapidly changes, again, kind of the way that human culture presents itself. It uh, creates new job opportunities. It, it shifts our reliance economically away from agriculturally produced goods. We're able to start um, industrially producing uh, mass quantities of consumer products. And then from the 1950s on, we've seen a rise in technology. We've seen us entering the computer age, the space age, etc. You know, this point where, you know, look at your cell phone, for example. Look at the computer on which you're accessing this material, the device on which you're accessing this material. I mean, 50 years ago, it would take up an entire building uh, to have that, those kinds of, that kind of computer processing available. And, and now we've got really entire computers in the palms of our hands. <clears throat> Anthropology tackles human adaptation and human biology with this biocultural perspective. We're not looking solely at the nature part of nature versus nurture. We're solely at the nurture part of nature versus nurture. Instead, we are combining biological and cultural approaches to a given problem. So we talked a bit already about how this might change. I mean, Sherpas don't need to use supplemental oxygen to summit Everest, whereas Westerners, Europeans, Americans do. Um, there are key environmental forces that determine how our bodies grow and develop. 
Think about nutrition and energy expenditure and growth and development. We know, for example, that uh, competitive gymnasts, competitive ballet dancers, endurance runners, etc., have a very different body build than people who don't engage in that kind of endurance training and strict dietary regimens. We know that uh, participating in competitive gymnastics and ballet can cause girls to delay that age at which they hit menarche. They reach, they start menstruating early, or young, uh, sorry, they start menstruating older. Uh, they delay kind of this entry into <clears throat> adolescent and adult development. Um, think about the growth of obesity in, in the United States today, right? We, uh, we have plenty of calories at our disposal. We're changing our microbiome. We're changing kind of the way that we process food, the way that our bodies process food. And this results then in a higher deposition of fat around our abdomens. Cultures also relax some selection pressures on human biology. Many of us rely on assistive, uh, you know, visual devices, assistive devices to <clears throat> be able to achieve visual acuity, i.e. we need glasses and contacts. If we were living as hunter-gatherers and we had poor eyesight, we would not be successful. We would either be culled from the group through like infanticide or something, or we would not be chosen as mates, particularly for males, because they'd be very unsuccessful as hunters if they're not able to see the animals they need to track. Um, we can also see that cultural standards of attractiveness and, and propriety influence participation and achievement in sports. We really, over the past 20 years, have uh, have really opened the door, not just to allowing and giving access to girls to play sports, but in really this massive cultural acceptance. It's now acceptable to have what we would call an athletic physique. We don't need to have the soft curves of Marilyn Monroe. We don't need to um, have even the, the very thin, almost bony physiques of supermodels in the 1970s, like Twiggy. You know, we are allowing women to have some curves, but also embracing the idea that women can be strong, women can be fit, women can be athletic. This varies cross-culturally. And so here we have figure one, two, just looking at um, kind of in introducing our four subfields, um, because from here we are going to talk about these four subfields in part two of this lecture.